Okay, good morning, and thank you all for coming to our press conference this morning. We're here to discuss an open invitation from American Muslim organizations to the Republican Party, uh, asking them to examine the current relationship and explore ways to move forward. I'm Corey Saylor. I'm the National Legislative Director for the Council on American Islamic Relations. I will make a quick overview of the content of the letter, and then I'll introduce each of our speakers in turn. Uh, we've asked them to keep their remarks fairly brief, and then we'll open it up for questions. So the letter itself essentially explores two main constitutional issues that the American Muslim community sees coming, particularly from the Republican Party. And the first thing we focus on in the letter is the fact that over the last two years, there have been 78 anti-Islam bills introduced in state legislatures and in the U.S. Congress, 73 of which were sponsored solely by Republicans. Uh, that leads to a lot of concern that this is not coming from fringe legislators. So these are bills that, in contradiction to the First Amendment of the United States, target a particular religious faith, whether they do so in the language of the bill or what that's the background discussion. And they all too often have the support of mainstream Republican Party leadership. So in Oklahoma, the Governor Fallon was behind the bill there. In Alaska, you had the head of the House Judiciary Committee speaking in favor of it. In Missouri, you had the House Speaker speaking in favor of the bill. So that is one particular constitutional concern that this community has in being targeted by Republicans. The second one really showed its head during the early presidential debates among the Republican Party, where you had Herman Cain, in particular, who was a front runner. Newt Gingrich also did this. But Cain said specifically that Muslims who wanted to serve in his administration would have to take some kind of a loyalty oath. Now, Article 6 of the US Constitution prohibits religious tests for public office. And so Cain really should have been essentially laughed off the stage for saying things that were in contradiction to the Constitution, and instead what he got was applause and support from party members and really no pushback whatsoever from the party leadership. So to quickly sum up the letter, those are the two core constitutional issues we're talking about here when we say that the Republican Party needs to consider its approach to the American Muslim community. We make five very specific recommendations. Uh, the party needs to speak out against bias within its own ranks. Far too often that's been overlooked. The Republicans need to make a concerted effort to engage Muslim voices or Muslim voters. Republicans need to oppose efforts to pass these dis discriminatory legislation instead of being behind it. They need to reject efforts to use public forums to smear minorities. And in particular, we would point to Congressman Peter King's anti-Muslim hearings. There were five of them held between 2010 and 2000, excuse me, between 2011 and 2012. Uh, he should have been told by the leadership in the House, no, uh, that kind of smearing is something more for the 1950s or the history of this country and not something that belongs in the present. And then finally, we're asking the Republican Party to end the persistent witch hunt of Muslim organizations that we see coming from its ranks. Most recently manifest in Michelle Bachman attempting to smear any Muslim who has come forward to serve their country uh, in the public sector. So with that said, that's the outline of the letter. I will now introduce our speakers. Our first speaker is Mr. Nihad Awad. He is the National Executive Director with the Council on American Islamic Relations. Thank you, Cory. And I would like to thank uh, representatives of our national organizations who joined us today at this uh, important uh, press conference. Um, a little bit about the letter. The letter was composed and was meant to be published in the Washington Times because it is mainly read by uh, conservatives. And we wanted to make sure that the community uh, puts resources in making sure that our position is made known and distributed and hopefully read and reflected on by the leadership of the uh, Republican Party. The signers on this letter, uh, we believe, represents the overwhelming majority of American Muslims across the board uh, in the United States. And therefore, uh, this open letter reflects the sentiments, the concerns, but also the hopes of American Muslims vis-a-vis -vis the relationship uh, with the Republican Party. 
uh, Corey mentioned the core issues that we addressed in this letter, uh, but also I would like to emphasize a couple of issues. Number one, the anti-Muslim legislation that have been introduced in the past two years. Many of them are going to be reintroduced in 2013. So far, 73, per, 73 of these legislation out of 78 are and have been introduced by a Republican legislature nationwide. And this is very unfortunate. That means 93% of the anti-Muslim legislation have been introduced by Republican uh, uh, legislators. And this is very concerning to us and should be a message to the Republican Party to decide, are they going to be the party of bigots and the party that fights the religious rights of another minority like the American Muslims? Or are they going to be uh, helping the nation to be on the right course by being inclusive and respect people irrespective of their ethnicity, their religious belief, or political orientation? Number two, we are not talking about fringe members of the Republican Party. We're talking about core leadership of the Republican Party who have been using their platform to attack American Muslims, question their loyalty, and attack their faith. And we believe this is un-American and even un-Republican because the Republican Party was not like this. And this announcement today is an open invitation for them to reassess their positions and work with the American Muslim community. The third point is many of these members have lost the election, like Alan West, Adam Hansner, Paul Walsh, and a few others. And that shows that American voters reject Islamophobia because it is divisive and does not help the country. For those who stayed in office by a small margin, like Michelle Bachman, that is a message to him that she should not use or abuse her position and the trust that the voters gave her to do the business of the people rather than attacking a Muslim community that has been working hard to make this country greater. America is the land of new beginnings. And the American people need two things. Constructive action on major problems facing the country and return to civic discussion. So we hope that the Republican Party will see this as an opportunity to move forward with the American Muslims. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nihad. Our next speaker is Mr. Osama Jamal. He is the chairman of the Muslim American Society Public Affairs Civic Engagement. Thank you, Corey. The uh, Muslim American Society Public Affairs and Civic Engagement joins hand with the member organizations of the Muslim community in extending an invitation to the Republican Party to reassess its views and relationship with the Muslim American community. Traditionally and historically, we had a good relationship, but the unfortunate influence of extreme views have distorted this relationship. Uh, the Muslim American society is part of the American society, and there should be no discrimination or demonization of any Americans because of their religious belief or because of their background. The practice that we have noticed in the recent years by the Republican Party did not reflect the basis, the values that the, American, uh, the, the Republican Party stands for and as well as the Democratic Party. So we hope that this is an opportunity as we face the challenges that face our country uh, are more important than the divisive views of one another, that we join hands and look for forward and uh, work together to improve our, the life of American people and respect the diversity that we cherish. That is the hallmark 
of the, of the American people. So we hope this is an invitation that will have a reciprocal positive response, and we look forward uh, to hearing back from the Republican Party. Thank you. Thank you very much, Osama. Our next speaker is Mr. Naeem Beg. He is with the Islamic Circle of North America, Council for Social Justice. Thank you. Um, and uh, on behalf of Islamic Circle of North America, Council for Social Justice, I would like to thank CARE and other uh, members of the Muslim community and Muslim leadership for uh, standing here today in solidarity in, um, uh, with, in, in, in supporting the ad that appeared today in Washington Times uh, on behalf of CARE and uh, other Muslim organizations. Um, as uh, my other fellow um, uh, brothers and leaders from the Muslim community pointed out that there was a time when um, in uh, the first election of George W. Bush where American Muslim community, a good majority of the American Muslim community supported George W. Bush in, in his first uh, uh, election. Uh, and it was because of his stand against racial profiling and against any kind of uh, bigotry and hate. But what we have seen over the years, that um, that message disappeared and the message of hate uh, appeared, and most importantly, coming from uh, the most respected podiums uh, and from the presidential debates, where when these bigoted comments were made by these, um, those who were wishing to seek the highest position in our country, and the majority of the audience clapped on these bigoted comments. So that is a sign which is uh, alienate, alienating not just the Muslim community, uh, but also the other minorities in America. And as a result of that, uh, Nihad mentioned few names of Alan West and them, and Joe Walsh from Illinois. They were defeated because minorities stood together and decided that people who passed these bigoted, racist, hateful comments are not going to represent them in the, in the best uh, houses of our Congress. So in, in saying that, I stand by with other Muslim organizations in requesting the Republican Party, the party that is known to be of the Lincoln, the party where which stood in support of the minorities against uh, and, and in favor of uh, justice and equality that we will look, we look forward to meeting uh, and, and sitting together with the Republican Party and the leadership of the Republican Party and seeing where it went wrong and how they can correct these measures. And I thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Naeem. Our next speaker is Mr. Khalil Meek. He is the National Executive Director of the Muslim Legal Fund of America. <coughs> On behalf of the Muslim Legal Fund of America, it's a privilege to be here in solidarity with all the other uh, respected organizations and leadership, and especially CARE for taking this initiative, to reach out to the Republican Party and ask them to reassess their platform, reassess their engagement with the Muslim community. Uh, as an organization that helps Muslims face legal challenges, we see that the politics or the rhetoric of fear, the rhetoric of, of Islamophobia has severe consequences in our communities. When people get radicalized against the minority, things are not positive. So today we're calling on everybody to stay with the foundations and the principles of this country of inclusion, the politics of, of reaching out and having each and every one of us participate in that process as as equals, but with respect and dignity to uh, uh, everyone engaged. So uh, I just wanted to thank you uh, for uh, having an opportunity to show our support, and we ask that this is something that the Republican Party considers and has a positive response to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Khalil. Our next speaker is Imam Warth Adin Muhammad II. He is the president of the Mosque Cares. Good afternoon. I'm Wadithuddin Muhammad, the son of the late leader, Imam Wadithuddin Muhammad, uh, who passed in uh, 
2008, about four years uh, earlier, and he was the son of the uh, late leader and founder of the movement uh, called the Nation of Islam. Uh, so I have a history. My father was born a Muslim, and he taught Islam, lived Islam as a Muslim, and established his family. And he was the one that broke away from the, uh, the movement that his father helped build, which was more of a social reform movement, and brought us into mainstream Islam. So my whole life, although I was um, 45 now, I can say that, <laughs> uh, I was born during the time of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, but I was a young man. And my father, though he kept us away from the, uh, the Nation of Islam and their ideology, uh, mainly me, I had two older sisters at the time. Uh, I didn't get too much exposure to that language, but I, he had friends, immigrant uh, Muslim friends from different parts of the world, uh, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, uh, many different parts of the world. And I got to know uh, uh, people of Arab descent and Asian descent, uh, pretty much the way many of us grow up side by side, other immigrant Muslims and our, uh, immigrant people of different faiths and religions and nationalities in our neighborhoods and in, in uh, many of the cities across the U.S. Uh, so when I see the pattern of discrimination and bigotry in the language in places where they don't belong in politics and in, in positions of leadership, I uh, can't help but to reflect on the damage that it does to uh, families and to innocent minds and where it leads to self-destructive lives. Uh, uh, I always reflect to uh, a, a, a known statement that's uh, is constantly given to us in our community to remind us that the family is the root of civilization. And when you break down, uh, when you isolate families and make it difficult for them to establish themselves through bigotry and not joining them, into the big, the larger issue, we should keep our focus. It's my belief that we should keep our focus on the bigger issue, which is our human identity, and that's is what has uh, 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 helped us as a, a nation to progress to the point where we are, to where the leader in uh, social in social issues. We've so far ahead of most of the world that we're looked at as the role model and example for dealing with social issues, but still we have this ugly bigotry and this, this, this ugly, uh, immature type of behavior, and uh, it's, it's not a fair way uh, to deal with politics. And uh, we want to grow alongside and with America as families. I know uh, the, the brothers that are here with us, we're not uh, political-driven, motivated people as most Americans are, most, most American families at heart, they're family people and community people. And this is what Islam hopes to establish, is to be an asset to the broader community of uh, citizens of this United States. And uh, as you know, many of you may or may not know that my father, Imam W.D. Muhammad, was one to pioneer interfaith uh, dialogue and uh, communications, and he was extremely successful in his work. And also, he was one of the first uh, African Americans uh, towards the end of the Civil Rights Movement to embrace the American flag and our citizenship. And, you know, this has had been fed to me as a child, the importance of uh, citizenship here in the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much, Imam. And as our final speaker, Mr. Usama Abu Urshade. He is with American Muslims for Palestine. On behalf of the American Muslims for Palestine, I would like to thank CARE for taking this initiative, not only on behalf of the American Muslim community, but on behalf of America, to combat, to combat the forces of intolerance and bigotry in this country. And while we think that the groups of intolerance and bigotry in this country might indeed represent a tiny minority in, in this country, yet we think that their rhetoric and their actions threatens all of the values that we stand for as an American people, the values of respect, justice, and equality for all. Also, I think the Republican Party needs to take uh, a lesson from the previous elections, the last elections, that showed clearly that the Republican Party is 
increasingly, increasingly getting out of touch with the new realities on the ground in this country, the social realities and the cultural reality in this country. The Republican Party now is being dominated by forces that reject the other, that reject minorities, whether being uh, minorities in terms of religion or in terms of uh, ethnicities. And the Republican Party needs to reassess its, situ it, its position and its stance for the sake of America, not for the sake of a political party or another, but for the sake of this country and for the sake of the spirit of this country. And we think that the Muslim community today represent the conscious maybe of America that shows if that proves if America is standing with its uh, values or not. And we think that the American people are a people of conscience and that the American people are standing with the values that are enshrined by our constitution and we think that this such ideology of hatred will be rejected by all the American people. Thank you.